So as we, as we start, I want to start by asking you guys to think about this. Um, in what ways do you try to or have you tried to achieve status in your life? What ways in your life do you try to achieve status or have you tried to achieve a certain status in your life? I want you to actually think about that. For me, when I was in high school, uh, it seemed like high school was all about achieving status. I bought into the idea that the more accolades I had, the more academically successful I was, the more varsity letters athletically I earned, the more status I would receive. You see, I, I thought that, man, my, my high school career is all about getting that scholarship or getting into that school. For me, I chased status all over the place. I, I chased it in academics, and, but I did so with the purpose of being able to say that I was better than the 515 people behind me in class rank. Athletically, I was accomplished in some areas, and I, and I failed in others, right? I had this view that, man, so I was successful in cross-country and track, but I failed because I, I wasn't as, as good in basketball, and basketball seemed like the more public sport, and so it didn't seem like I achieved the status I was looking for. And you see, the, the issue is the world actually feeds into this because you can actually achieve something by achieving status. For me, I got into a school known as Wayne State. Some call it the Harvard of Midwest. And, and that's where I got the privilege of going to school. And you see, in, in, in high school, I, I had the grades. I was a varsity letter winner in multiple sports. I was a national qualifier in air rifle. I was an Eagle Scout. And, and all those things achieved me a full ride, nearly a full ride to college. So the issue is that we actually can do it, right? In some ways, we actually can achieve status. The issue isn't, isn't that accomplishing things doesn't get us anywhere. The issue is that status in the world can actually get us somewhere. It can build us up and separate us from others, making us feel more worthy of whatever it is, right? How often do we, we feel more worthy of blank? And it might take different shapes, and in your life, it might look different. It might look like you having the perfect social media to maximize the amount of likes you get, or it might look like buying a bigger house you need, than you needed to keep up with the Joneses, or it might look like you showing off your accomplishments. The reality is, chasing status is all about us, about what we get, and about how we can be served. The idea of chasing status for ourselves or using things or others for what is best to us is the core problem of sin. But what God intends is that we don't use things or others to acquire status for ourselves, but to use whatever status or resources that we have been given in order to serve him and others. And ultimately, that's how God is. And that's how God intends us to live. You see, too often we are consumed with ourselves and what we can get out of something. We are continually asking ourselves the wrong question of how can we be served by this thing, when rather we should be seeking how can we serve. So today the idea I'm going to be looking at, in the kingdom, status is achieved by serving. In the kingdom, status is achieved by serving, all right? That's the main idea that we're going to be walking through as we walk through this text today. And the, the first idea today is honor by humbling. Honor by humbling. We're in chapter 20 of Matthew, starting in verse 17. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, see, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. So Jesus here, for the third time in the book of Matthew, he is predicting his death. 
And if you remember a few chapters ago, I believe it's chapter 16, the first time he predicts his death, Peter responds with saying, no, never, that won't happen on my watch. And Jesus rebukes him and says, get behind me, Satan. And then a little while later, we see Jesus predict his death a second time. And in that time, what we learn is that he would be betrayed by someone and that he'd be handed over to the religious elites. And here now, Jesus again tells his disciples that the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes. Scribes would be people who are teachers of the law. And he explains that these men would condemn him to death. But the new information that we gain is that he says he will be handed over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged, which is whipped, and to ultimately be crucified. And by doing this, what he is communicating to uh, a Jewish person in this time, when they heard the word Gentile, since um, the area was ruled by Romans at the time, he's saying, look, I'm going to be handed over, the Son of Man is going to be handed over to the Romans, and I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be hung on a cross because that was the Roman specialty. So in this time, he is pretty explicitly telling the disciples, hey, this is what is about to happen. I'm going to be killed, but then on the third day, I will come back to life. And we know that either the disciples weren't listening or they did not understand because they still were confused and surprised when Jesus died and then again when he came back to life. Church, the the issue with this is that this passage grows the risk of growing weary in our soul. And I have to admit, when I was reading this passage, as I was preparing, I was like, okay, yeah, man, he's already predicted his death uh, multiple other times, and we we know the story of the gospel, so okay, let me move past and see what the idea is. And I was like, okay, maybe, maybe he just put this in here a third time to make it apologetically stronger of like, oh man, an argument of it was just by chance that Jesus did this. Well, no, he actually predicted it three times and then it, came, it happened exactly as he said he would. So maybe it's just like an apologetic argument. It is that, but it's more than that. Or maybe it's just this idea that he wants to keep bringing us back to you, but I'm like, okay, but why? And so as I actually dug into it, what, where the Lord led me was to focusing on the phrase, son of man. The title, Son of Man, is a title of humanity, humility, and honor. It would be a title of humanity in that because it explains that he is a member of the Trinity, but he was born into a human body, just as physical as you you and I are. It points to his humility because we see that Jesus was despised and rejected by mankind. He had no place to lay his head. He would not use his position as God to be gain something to be used for his own advantage, and he would ultimately suffer a disgraceful punishment by becoming a curse on a cross, because in Deuteronomy it says, cursed is everyone who dies on a tree. It also points to his honor. And this is where I want to spend more of our time today. The name Son of Man originates in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And in this passage, Daniel is having a vision And he says, the Son of Man comes on the clouds. And that this man was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. And that all people would serve him. So Daniel has a vision of Jesus ultimately being given all glory and honor. And that he was exalted above all. You see, to imagine the Son of Man from Daniel 7, it says that he's going to rule above all. That everyone would serve him. To then hear Jesus using the same phrase saying the Son of Man is going to be condemned to death. This would not make sense in the context of where they are in this time. He was supposed to rule over all. He was supposed to be above all others. And dying on a cross was to become a curse. How did this make sense? Jesus was the one who was to be honored and to be served, and he would ultimately be humiliated and serve us. Jesus, as he predicted his own death, was was flipping the script on what his exaltation would look like because he rightly deserves to be honored, and he rightly deserved then to be honored. But for our sake, he would be humbled before taking his rightful place. Church, this is the gospel, that Jesus, the one who deserved all honor, 
would humble himself by being crucified for you and for me. Daniel's vision would lead those who believed in Christ to understand the honor that Christ rightly deserved, but didn't understand that he would be exalted, that before he would be exalted into heaven where he deserves to be, that he would be humbled by sacrificing himself on a cross. He was there to serve us. He took his exalted position and came down from heaven, having been there in the beginning, having been the one who created everything on the throne. He was exalted above everything, and he took a low place by becoming a man. With that, I'm going to lead to my next point. Status by service. Status by service. Picking up in verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. And Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. All right, so, so in this context, what happens is the, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, that would be the mother of James and John, comes to Jesus, and they're, they're by her side, and they come to Jesus, and, and she says, hey, Jesus, will you grant that in your kingdom, these two guys, like, they're great, right? Like, would they get to sit one on your left and one on your right? And he looks at them and says, you don't know what you're asking. You don't know what it is, because in her mind, she still had this idea of a political kingdom. She still thought, even after he just said what he was going to do, after he just said that he was going to die, she still did not understand and thought there was going to be a political kingdom and was like, hey, let them sit on either side. And Jesus, rather than rebuking, says, can you drink my cup? And he's saying, can you endure what I have coming to me? Can you endure the suffering that I am to experience? Because that is my cup. And James and John, standing there, they, they respond quickly and say, we can. Obviously, they're, they're ignorant of what is to come. You see, a few chapters later, James and John would desert, with the other disciples, would desert Jesus. And later on, they actually would bear the cup and drink the cup because we would see that they would endure the suffering as James would be the first apostle to be martyred and John was um, the only apostle to not be martyred, not by lack of trying, but he was ultimately exiled to an island. So they did endure suffering. They did ultimately drink the cup, but they did not understand in this moment what they were saying. And Jesus finishes by saying it was not for him to decide, but rather it was for them to subject themselves to the will of their father, just as he was doing. Hey, it's not for me to decide where you are in the kingdom, but you must submit to the father's plan. And so this, this all takes place, and Jesus is communing with them, and, and the other disciples are standing there hearing what's going on, and they are furious. Not because they said, hey, that is an inappropriate question to ask. They're furious because James and John had their mom ask them the thing that they wanted, right? I mean, you might say, okay, they were actually bold enough. Well, their mom was bold enough to ask them for that place in heaven. They were, it's not in heaven, but their place in the kingdom. They're mad. So Jesus, understanding and seeing the hearts of the disciples, responds and knowing, responds explaining how his kingdom was to operate. 
He starts by saying, man, you see that the Gentiles have position of authority and they lord it over the people underneath them, not to be so with you. This is not the way it's supposed to happen. He is again returning us to a right understanding of what the kingdom was to look like. The disciples, understanding kingdoms in a way of a hierarchical system, had this view of a political kingdom in which they would be at the top. They said, man, Jesus is our ticket to power and influence and authority. He says, you don't understand. Actually, whoever wants to be great in my kingdom will only achieve it by becoming like a slave, like a servant. And Jesus uses the term slave and servant because slaves and servants in this time were at the very bottom of the totem pole. Everyone, quite literally, was above them. These people would not have status in life. So he's saying you must become like them, going low and serving. This mindset was key so that the disciples would understand that Jesus wasn't advocating that they just serve people of prominence but rather that they would realize, or they, that the disciples would realize it's not just me that you need to serve. Like that, They would realize that their path to status in the kingdom, the way to be great in the kingdom, was not how the world would say it should look. But their path to being great, their path to status, was to take the low place. Their path to greatness was to take the low place, to serve as a servant would. And Jesus doesn't just tell them that they need to serve, but he ends this portion with possibly one of the most famous statements about what he came to do. Because he says, For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus, in serving the low, would ultimately die for those who he had rightly deserved to be served by. And in Daniel 7, it says that the Son of Man would be served. Yet here we see Jesus saying he did not come to be served. But he came to give his life, he to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And you see, when I was reading this passage, I found it interesting that Matthew didn't write serve by giving his life as a ransom for many. He said serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That made me pause and think, okay, there's, there's two points here. Because very quickly I'll, in that passage, whenever I heard that quote, I always think of, oh yeah, he came to give his life as a ransom for many. But I, I oftentimes skip by the serve part said, oh yeah, Jesus was serving us by doing that. That makes sense. But, but I had to slow down and realize that he, he said that he came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. What if our mindset while we were on the earth was the same as Christ was? Jesus was serving us by laying his life down for us. That was one way. But then ultimately, as we're going to continue to see, he was serving us as he was living as well because that was his purpose. So what would it look like if our mindset was the same? The Christian's purpose is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. And here I would say that Jesus is saying the way we glorify him, the way we enjoy him is by going low and living a life of service. Not using our place of influence for our gain, but ultimately to serve others. If there is... If there is a desire to serve God in your heart, it must be that there is a desire to serve others as well. So practically, what would this look like for you? Maybe you're in the workplace. For you, it would look like rather than just climbing the corporate ladder and climbing over everyone else around you to get what you think you deserve, that you'd actually desire to serve people around you. That you would actually, in that, live a life that would go against the grain. And you would realize while doing that, you might never get recognized for it. If you're in college, in the throes of competing against people around you for internships and scholarships and honors and awards and class ranks and everything else, would would it be that, man, maybe you actually seek to serve and help the people around you? You actually desire to help those who you think you're competing with. If, if you're popular in the world's eye, maybe that means you use that position to bring in the outcast, to bring in the weirdo. It means that you're not ashamed of who you're associated with. A call to service is a call to die to yourself, church. 
And let me be clear in saying that accomplishments and accolades and promotions, those things are not bad. Those things are good gifts from the Father. And I, I mean, if we look at how God used people of prominence and status in the Old Testament, we would see that he used it for his glory, right? We look at Joshua, who was elevated from a place of a slave to second in command in Egypt, and he used that ultimately to serve and to save the Israelites. If we look at Nehemiah, who was a cupbearer to the king, that means he was right next to the king and all the things he was doing, God used him to ultimately ask the king to fund the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem in enemy territory to give them protection and to let him go, to give him protection and to pay for it himself, right? Or we see Esther, who God uses a position of prominence and how she gains favor with the king to ultimately save the Jews. So I'm not saying that positions of prominence are bad, but the heart behind it is a need to be to serve. In the kingdom of God, what it looks like, no matter the position you're in, whether you're on the bottom of the totem pole in your company or you're at the very top, the the call is the same. The call is to serve. Their position, our position does not disqualify you from service. And if we fast forward, there was another person who came from a position of prominence who served. Coming back to it, that's Jesus. Jesus came to serve those who didn't deserve to be served. And let me ask, uh, hear this question carefully. How often in your life do you desire to serve the people that you think do deserve to be served, right? How quick are you to actually serve the people? You're like, oh man, they actually deserve it. And then ask yourself, How quick are you to serve the people you don't think are worth serving? And I know for me, this is a struggle. Literally, I was in the middle of writing this section of my sermon, and my wife comes home from Sam's. And you know, if someone comes home from Sam's Club or Costco, it is going to be a haul of stuff in their vehicle, right? And so she comes in, and uh, I was like, oh, man, do you need help? And she saw that I was working. She's like, oh, no, it's okay. And I was like, ah, oh, sweet, I can just keep going. And the Holy Spirit was like, really? Like, do you not understand, like, the, pet, the message I'm giving you right now? Like, the call to serve? I was like, you're right. So I was, like, literally in the middle of a grind. And I was like, okay, I got I to gotta go out and serve. I got I to gotta go out and, like, take in all the fruit that my wife decided to buy. I was like, all right, I got, that's great. I, I'll, I'll help. But that's not my natural bent. And I was meeting with an older man in the faith uh, probably a month or two ago, and I was talking to him, and and he was telling me that his life's desire, his life's desire is to outserve his wife. And he said, look, like, I make it my absolute goal that no one could say that people outserve me, especially my wife. He says, I do everything I can to serve her. Because he said, I understand that to be great in the kingdom of God is to become like a servant. To serve. And in my mind, when he was telling me this, I was like, man, I know that's good. And I know that that's what I should desire. But if I'm honest, it sounds a whole lot better to be outserved by my spouse, right? <laughs> because I, you get the benefit of it, right? Like if they're outserving you, it sounds a whole lot better to be on that side of it. And I was convicted. I was like, man, like that needs to be my mindset. But in my natural man, in my natural self, I would much rather receive the benefit of someone serving me than going low and serving those around me. Our position in our life, whatever status God has given you, whatever position of influence God has given you, ultimately, it is not for you. The call for you, again, no matter where you're at, the lowest end, the middle, the highest end, the overlooked, The call for you is to serve. Jesus says that he came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. The definition of ransom, quite literally from Google, is a sum of money or other payment demanded or paid for for the release of a prisoner. Quite practically, to give oneself as a ransom is to give oneself as a payment for. 
Jesus came to give his life as a payment for us so that we could be ransomed. Because everyone in here at one point owed a debt that they could not pay. Owed a debt which would have led them to eternity in hell. And Jesus met us in our need while we were slaves to sin, children of disobedience, with an insurmountable debt. He came and he paid it. That is beautiful. And that is the ultimate display of service. Him for us. He served us that we might be given positions of honor as God's children. And as we are co-heirs with Christ, he calls us into the same life of service he preached and also modeled for us in the next story. The next point is sight from the Savior. Sight from the Savior. I'm going to finish up reading the chapter, verse 29. And as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? They said, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus, in pity, touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. There's a lot I could say about this, but quite simply, Jesus is continuing his journey to Jerusalem, right? So he's on his way to Jerusalem with a large crowd of people because they're on their way to celebrate the Passover. And as they are walking there are these beggars on the road knowing that this is a good time to beg because there's going to be tons of people. And they, they hear that, oh man, this guy named Jesus who we've heard about is coming. We're going to cry out to him. And the crowd said, man, these people are not worthy. So they shushed them. Said, hey, be quiet. Like, stop. Like, this guy is a man of influence, of position, of status. Like, no, no, no. You, you need to be quiet. They didn't let that stop them. They kept crying out to Jesus. And Jesus ultimately deems them worthy of his time. He serves them. He touches their eyes, heals them of their blindness, and they get up with their sight recovered, and they follow Jesus. What's interesting about this story is we know nothing more about these men. We know that they were blind. We know that they were considered worthy of Jesus' time, and we knew that they were beggars. And we know that ultimately they were healed and they followed Jesus. These beggars were deemed hindrances, but Jesus found them worthy. They weren't necessarily the most strategic people, and not much was expected out of them. It doesn't say that they came from a good family with power and influence, or that they had much upside. But Jesus deemed them worth serving. In our world today, who might this be for you? You see, I was, I was asked that question, man, who today might that be for us? Who, who might be those blind people on the side of the road? And, and there, are, there are some things I could say, like, oh, man, maybe it's the person who's panhandling, or maybe it's the, the person who's poor or whatever. I, maybe it is for you, but I actually would say, ask yourself, who is that person in your life? Who is that person that you actually don't deem worthy of serving? Who is the overlooked in your life? Who is the person who's being passed by? Who's being the person who's being shoved aside? Let's say that's for you to wrestle with and for the Spirit of God to give you an answer to. What's interesting also about this passage is Jesus had every reason not to stop. If we understand the context, Jesus just got done saying, man, I am on my way to die. Jesus knew, man, I am on my way to go sacrifice myself for the people of God. I'm on my way to go be whipped and beaten, to be betrayed by my disciples. He knew what was at stake. He knew what he was walking towards. He knew, man, I I have my mind on things. I know what I'm headed to. It would have been really easy, and no one really would have blamed him, right? 
And for you, man, maybe there's a lot going on in your life, and you say, man, but there's all this stuff going on. I don't have time to serve. Well, Jesus, in a moment when he's literally on his way to his own death sentence, he says, no, I'm going to take time to serve these people. If you are in here and you have never surrendered your life to Jesus, I would argue that right now you're like the blind men. You're blind to the gospel. You're blind to the things of the Spirit of God. If you're in here and you have never placed your faith in Jesus and you have never stopped playing the religious game, if you're here because someone invited you because you wanted to see the cute girl or the cute guy, if you're here because you think, man, this is the way I get to heaven, if that's why you're here, but in your heart of hearts you know that you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, you're like the blind men. And you're in need of someone healing you. But the healing you need isn't a physical, literal healing from blindness. The healing you need is you need to be brought from death to life. So if you're in here and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, would you consider what it would look like to bow your knee to him? Would it not be just a right understanding of who this was? The blind men understood. They called him Lord and Son of David. They had a right understanding of who he was and they still needed something else. You can have a right knowledge of who Jesus is and still be blind and dead. So if you're in here and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, would you even afterwards consider talking to someone about what it would look like to surrender your life to Jesus? And church, if you are in here and you've been born again of the Spirit of God, in light of the gospel, in light of what Jesus did for us, and in light of the the way he modeled it for us, Who is someone in your life that you need to serve without expectation of anything in return? I often play this game of, man, I've served this many times. I'm I'm owed this. But who in your life is someone you need to be willing to serve without expectation of anything in return? You were ransomed by Christ. That is all the motivation you need. That is all the motivation I need. And in closing, I want to finish by reading for us a passage from the letter uh, to the church in Philippi. It's not going to be on the screen, so if you just want to listen here. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let that settle in. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you, not, each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, that though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in the human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Here, he gives the command, the same command I'm giving to you. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. View others more highly than yourselves. And then he gives the why. And it connects really well to Daniel 7 and Matthew 20. It says here that he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He humbled himself to serve us. And then, like in Daniel 7, when it said that he would be exalted and served, it finishes in this passage saying that God highly exalted him and he is on his throne. You see, the the prophecy in Daniel did come true but it came differently than many expected it would. Would that be your motivation, church? Would that be your motivation to go and do likewise? Let's pray. 
Lord. Lord, thank you that ultimately you came to serve us. Lord, that ultimately you came to serve us by dying on a cross on our behalf. We owed a debt we could not pay. And Lord, you ransomed us. Lord, I pray that for anyone in here, they would need encouragement. They would need conviction that your spirit would just give them that. Your spirit would meet them where they're at, Lord, and that you would do a mighty work that you would help my heart to be shaped and formed by this passage with a desire to serve. Not serving out of grumbling, but Lord, serving out of a place of motivation of the fact that you first did it for us. Lord, would you help us to die to ourselves? In your name, amen.